And so good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. We have people from all over the country. And, and so uh, thanks for taking the time out today to, to talk about anti-Asian racism and missed COVID-19. And uh, I, I mentioned it before, but everyone's muted and everyone's video off just so we can have a focused time. And we'll, we'll, depending on how the question and answer goes, we'll, we'll unmute and, and share video then. But I wanted to start off with just expressing thanks and gratitude that we could just have this time together and, and have this conversation. As an Asian American myself, and as I've been talking with other Asian Americans really across the country recently, I found that we tend not to talk about this. We tend not to talk about anti-Asian racism, kind of put it under the table and, and kind of just want to move on. But especially in this COVID-19 situation, it seems like uh, anti-Asian anti racism has kind of um, come more to the forefront. And I've shared with some of you or some of you know that, that are listening right now that I experienced a racist incident in my neighborhood that's 60% Asian. I had my whole family with me, my four little kids, my wife. And, um, and though it was a really tough situation, but I, I, I also felt like the Lord allowed it to happen in a sense, just so that I could be freshly in touch with what's happening and what a lot of Asian Americans across the country are feeling and experiencing. And so this is just a good opportunity for us to talk about it and uh, get, get more informed. And so we're thankful for this opportunity. And I, I just wanted to say that I do firmly believe that Jesus in this time does want to heal our country in, in this regards, in terms of racism, anti-Asian racism, but racism in general. And I think that this conversation we're having today is part of it. So one logistical thing before we introduce our, our speaker today is I just want to mention that if you have a question along the way, uh, if you could post it in the chat feature, and if you post it in the chat feature, then we will be able to, uh, I'll be able to read it and then I'll be able to read it out later. So if you have a question, post it in the chat feature and uh, we'll engage it after uh, Daniel Lee's uh, talk. So we're really grateful to have Daniel Lee on today and I appreciate him so much, um, especially personally, he's been a mentor to me and especially in the last couple of years when it comes to Asian American ministry. And so you might, you probably read it already on the registration page, but he's the assistant provost for the Center for Asian American Theology and Ministry and also the Assistant Professor of Theology in Asian American Ministry at Fuller Seminary. And we got a lot of vineyard folks on this uh, uh, call. And so I just want to mention, uh, Daniel has a lot of vineyard roots. He would say that he grew up in, on a vineyard worship and he was actually a vineyard worship leader at a vineyard church plant back in the day. And so uh, that's our little vineyard connection with Daniel. So. Really grateful, Daniel, to have this opportunity for you to share. And uh, I've learned a lot from you. And actually, in the opportunities I get in the Vineyard Movement to share at seminars and conferences, I share a lot of what Daniel has, uh, has taught me over the years. So Daniel, uh, go ahead and take it away. And uh, we, we uh, are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. Um... So um, let me kind of, uh, I'm very happy to be here. And I'm, I'm I think, uh, interacting with uh, uh, Dennis uh, through the vineyard and uh, kind of getting connected in that way has been a, a good, great pleasure. As, as uh, Dennis shared, I've actually had some connections, you know, over the years, uh, I kind of consider my spirituality to be formed uh, very significantly by the vineyard. Um, I would consider myself kind of a charismatic reformed theologian. So all that I think is, is uh, due to my uh, vineyard interaction. Um, let me kind of, uh, uh, here, let me see here. So we talk about the, our Asian American Center just a bit. Uh, so the Asian American Center has been around um, and before, the, before that, the initiative, uh, I've, been, I've been at Fuller for what, like, I guess over 12 years now. Um, I know, actually, I think about all together, like 15 years. And I've spent the last uh, 11 years kind of building this Asian American Center. Um, uh, before that, there wasn't actually like a center for us to kind of uh, um, focus on Asian American context and ministry. So uh, uh, I'm the direct, you know, I kind of direct the center. Uh, as a center, we basically focus on researching Asian American theology, Asian American context and ministry. We equip, we train, we, we actually have classes, we actually have uh, formation groups and different things like that. And then we actually have resources like um, if you see here we have I have a link to the podcast the centering podcast um, we, this is this is going on for four seasons and there's actually other things that we do that we'll upload as well 
Um, so check that out. And um, um, yeah, I think our goal is to uh, think about what the gospel looks like in the Asian American context. So we have a lot of Asian Americans who, um, who are partake in our classes. And also we have non-Asian Americans. So for Asian Americans, I think it's basically, they get trained to do whatever ministry. There's a lot of people who go through our program who basically want to do Asian, you know, multi-ethnic stuff. They kind of go through it. And then there are other um, non-Asian Americans who want to learn about uh, Asian American context. Along with many things like heritage and everything else, we also cover race, which is a significant topic. And so uh, I want to start by, by thinking about um, who God is, because that's actually the very beginning of everything, right? When we think about this, this discussion of race, the question is, how does it connect with our theology? How does it connect with who God is? Because if we can't connect it, then, uh, then it becomes more of like a progressive agenda, right? Pro progressive kind of theolo you know, uh, stance. So I want to kind of, for some of you might be familiar with this, <clears throat> but I kind of wanted to think about who God is and how that connects to this discussion. And thinking about it, you know, our God is the God of the covenant. So when we say God is the God, God of the covenant, we're talking about our God as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not like an abstract idea, but he actually enters time, space, and interacts with particular people, seeing where people are. So whether it be Abraham, whether it be Moses, you know, interacting in an Egyptian context, or whether it be Daniel in the Babylonian context, or Esther within Persian context, there's a particular covenant that God has and he, he kind of interacts in history, right? And this is actually what you see all throughout. God deals particularly with people. So when God's interacting with Moses, there's actually a particular call and a particular way that Moses has to be faithful. So you can't like interchange what, how God interacts with Moses, with Esther or Mary or Daniel or whoever, because there's a particular thing that God's doing and we're supposed to, and they, in their context, is supposed to attend to God and what God says. Um, God is a God of creation. And of course, God affirms us as, as the God of incarnation and resurrection, right? God enters creation. And in that sense, um, it affirms that our bodies matter, our particular bodies matter. God enters creation as a Jewish man, right? Particularly a Jewish man, which connects with covenant and also creation. So there's a particular sense in which our creation matters. Even in heaven, it's not like all our bodies will become generic. We don't become generically human, but particularly human. And this is gonna be, it's going to come in uh, as, as an important uh, aspect of theology when we talk about why racism matters and, and what happens matters, right? Um, and also God has got a king, God of the kingdom. Um, uh, when we talk about Jesus being Lord, now, I think this sense has really gotten lost over time. But when we say Jesus is Lord, that's a, that's a political idea. Because back then, who was Lord? Caesar is Lord, right? So people knew when, they, when we, and they, they were proclaiming that Jesus was Lord, it was actually a controversial political statement. Now, it doesn't mean that the, 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 that the gospel is politically, like, you know, uh, reduced down to politics, but that it actually had ramifications for every, everything, right? Every aspect of life, political as well. Um, so we want to kind of keep this in mind as we think about uh, anti-Asian racism, right? So uh, because if God wasn't like this, if God was just a generic uh, spiritual idea that we kind of just interact with, and history doesn't matter, then what happens to us in this particular time wouldn't really matter to God. It'd be like, well, you, you can actually apply it, but fundamentally, it's not something God cares about. Whereas when we read scripture, we see the fact that God is a God who actually enters and interacts with pe people in a particular situation in time. Now, talking about anti-Asian uh, racism, um, I think one of the things that we want to kind of look at this, how we understand this idea of anti-Asian racism is to think about the broader, broader context. So we're going to talk about history. We're going to talk about racialized identity uh, and um, why Asian American racism ends up kind of sometimes being ignored. So we'll kind of go through that one by one. Um, obviously, in terms of uh, processing anti-Asian racism, I mean, you know, there are so many resources out there now. I mean, like, I think every, every other day I see like a podcast and I see a different things, uh, you know, presentations, webinars on this thing. What I'm going to do is try to connect this to the theological aspect of it and then go deeper into why this is happening and why uh, 
uh, often we, as, uh, as Asian Americans, a lot of times we don't really know how to talk about uh, racism, right? So I mean, there are main things like, uh, you know, how to stay safe and how to process our anger, but understanding things at a deeper level is what we're trying to do. Uh, uh, to begin with, uh, it's anti-Asian racism and not anti-Chinese racism, right? I mean, there are people who are like, well, why don't we just call it Chinese virus? So I'm like, well, you know, in some sense, you're like, it's like Chinese food. This is where it comes from. I'm like, well, look, th the reason why that's actually really fraught is because of how race functions in America and how those, those labels function socially, right? That... Uh, you can be like, well, this is what I mean individually, but that, that when you say uh, label things in that particular way, it does something within society. And that, that's because our, our world is a very racialized world. And this is actually just kind of American history, right? Specifically too, that from the very beginnings of American, you know, uh, US, we have race coming in and it being a factor. Now it because stays hidden for a good chunk of it, right? Good chunk of history. And except for the black experience, it kind of becomes, it's something that we don't talk about, but everybody in, in the U.S. is racialized. And what, what that means is race, racialized in, in this way. Uh, it's not talking about your ethnic heritage. It's talking about what you look like, right? Sociologists talk about phenotype, the, the, the features you have. And the features you have determine how people interact with you. And because people interact with you in a certain way, you think of yourself that way too. So, you know, I'm Korean American. But in, in a lot of contexts, I'm just Asian American. It doesn't really matter who, you know, what I think I am. It's basically how people interact with us. And there's a particular Asian American history as well. Um, in this racialized identity, one of the key things is the fact that Asian Americans often get stuck between a black and white binary, right? So it's like, are you white enough or are you, are you uh, black? So for some Asian Americans who are like brown, right, they kind of get closer to like the, uh, the, 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 to black. And then the other people who are lighter skinned, who basically are more economically well off, they end up becoming more white, right? But because U.S. thinks about so much of U.S. history is framed in a black and white way, Asian Americans have no space. And because racism often is labeled as an anti-black thing, which is actually Anti-black thing is really important and actually it has deep roots. We have to acknowledge that there's, I think black uh, community has a, has a particular exceptional history and exceptional kind of experience that's actually very different, right? But if, if that's how you see the whole world, then uh, Asian American racism ends up being not really racism. And that's one of the reasons why, and this is something that, um, this is something that, um, all of us kind of internalized because so much of our history is told this way in a black and white way. So uh, in understanding um, anti-Asian racism, if you don't understand history, it, it almost sounds like, uh, you know, like reverse racism, like, oh, there's anti-Asian racism. Well, it's like, well, it's, it almost sounds like, um, you know, anti-white racism. Is that really racism? That's basically how people think about it and talk about it. And it would be like that if you didn't understand history. And so this is, this is probably one of the most important parts. If you, if you get nothing out of this seminar or this talk, I think it's the idea of invisible history. Um, unlike, um, unlike black history, Asian American history, and we have like 150 years, over 150 years of Asian American history, that remains largely hidden, right? People just don't know about it. It's not included in our primary or secondary education. It just hasn't been included. So when Asian Americans think about themselves, they don't actually understand their broader history. They only think about their own family it's, it's all the, and then their own church or community. This is probably one of the most important reasons, right? The first reason is black and white binary because things are talked about, anything race or anything racism is talked about in a black and white way. So if you're Asian American, you get lost in the middle and you yourself don't know how to enter the discussion. So when something happens to you, like, I don't understand what to do with this thing. But the second thing is Asian American history is just erased altogether. It's invisible. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're college educated. I've had most of my students at Fuller that take Asian American classes. They know more about black history than Asian American history. They don't know anything unless they've gone to Asian American studies. They actually don't, they literally know nothing about their history except they're like their own family. But because of that, when they think about anti-Asian racism, they think it's purely something that's happened like 
oh, something very subtle. Oh, somebody called me, you know, uh, some racial things, but you know, it's not that big of a deal. It's because people don't understand the long, long history of what this looks like. So when those incidences happen, it's an expression of something that has, de has deeper roots, right? I mean, the first uh, um, anti-immigrant law was, was the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? Or, you know, the, the only concentration camp well, before we have the ones we have right now, I mean, that it was, a, you know, a Japanese uh, incarceration, right, during World War II. So, and of course, it's, it's happening now uh, with undocumented. So if you don't understand this history, we think, oh, we actually have no history. It's everybody who's come recently. Um, and this is probably one of the most important things. Uh, first thing is a black and white binary. Second thing is a history in terms of how we understand this, uh, these things and, and how we understand our, uh, our contemporary situation in light of history. Um, there's a great documentary. If you, if you, if you don't know about it, because it's actually all over Facebook and it's a PBS documentary called Asian American. You can still stream it. I think all month, this month, it's a five hour series, great way to kind of ramp up on Asian American history super fast. Right. So just watch five hours of it and you'll get, you'll, you'll understand, um, uh, uh, you know, just, just some of the basics of Asian American history. Because Asian American history isn't, and Asian American studies isn't part of uh, our education, we don't know how to talk about our experiences. And we can't really see it. Like if it happens, you're like, is it a thing? But when you study it, you're like, oh, this is a thing. This has been going on for like decades, like over 100 years. And you're like, oh, I know what that is. And that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of Asian Americans have really difficult time, a difficult time talking about it. And of course, Christians is a different reason, right? Because we don't think about the theological reason we talked about before, the fact that we, don't, we kind of end up thinking about God as, as God who is basically above history. But that's, the Bible doesn't talk about it that way, right? So as somebody who doesn't care about the body, but clearly it's God of creation and incarnation, like God cares about our body, right? Uh, so when you understand history, you uh, understand this idea. Now, a lot of us actually, are, I think, are, are very familiar with, I think, this idea of modern minority myth, right? It's the fact that Asian Americans are all educated, they're all, you know, um, well off financially. And to some degree, in some demographic, it's true. Um, um, and this thing kind of really comes to fore, like this idea of modern minority, like in the, I mean, it starts like in the 50s, right? In, in the, in, during the Cold War. But later on, it really kind of solidifies in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And from there on, it's almost as though all Asian Americans are, are all kind of well-educated and, and well-off financially. But this idea of modern minority, it's kind of a social contract, uh, contract that Asian Americans uh, kind of have with society. It's the fact that society basically says, look, don't focus on all the injustices, racial problems of America. If you don't do that, like the black people, right? Because that's actually part of the modern minority myth. If you don't do that, then you can, you can actually succeed uh, financially and, and uh, in terms of academically, but you don't still have any uh, political or cultural power. It's just something that's actually really recent that's happening in terms of all the media representation and everything else, right? Because before, I mean, if some of you guys who are older, you know that on TV, like in movies, there was literally like no Asian American representation. This is actually really kind of ramped up in the last couple of years. Now, it turns out this idea of modern minority, the features that have Asian American is a superstar, super smart. They're actually, they work really hard. There's a flip side to it. And actually, it's this idea of yellow peril. Yellow peril comes from like, you know, like 150 years ago, right? Doing like the Chinese, first Chinese migration happening or the indentured servants happening, coming over. It's the idea of the fact that the Chinese are this uh, horrible, Asians are this horrible people that are going to come, bring disease, uh, you know, do, uh, that, are, that are morally deviant, right? And this idea sits in, uh, deep within the American conscious for a long time. What's weird is that one of the features of Yellow Peril uh, comes uh, out in this, uh, in this uh, fictional character called Fu Manchu. If you, if you do research on Fu Manchu, Fu Manchu is considered like one of the, one of the main uh, expressions of Yellow Peril. But Fu Manchu, get this, like, this is actually like, you know, uh, 
some of the characters of Fu Manchu is that he's actually, it's Dr. Fu Manchu. He's super well educated. He, he speaks multiple languages. He has multiple PhDs and he's very evil and wants to take over the world, right? It turns out that uh, scholars have said Yellow Peril and Modern Minority are not like opposites, but they're actually, uh, they're actually um, connected in a kind of a circle, right? So if you go to more to, toward modern memory so much, you'll end up with yellow peril. It's not like they're actually totally opposite. And that's basically why in different situations, yellow peril will come up random times. Like, you know, a, a, a Chinese scientist a couple of years ago was accused of espionage. I mean, just because he was too smart, too smart, too educated, he must be doing something wrong, right? This is actually... So you understand this modern minority yellow apparel when you understand Asian American history. If you don't have that history, uh, it's, just, it's incomprehensible. You have no words to describe it. You have no words to kind of articulate what's happening. You're like, oh, this is weird. People are ignorant. That's all you can say. People are ignorant. So that I don't. So therefore, uh, if they're just smart, then they'll understand that I'm not like that, right? It actually has, this racism has deep, deep roots. And it goes on for like over, you know, like I said, 150 years. So um, with that in mind, people understand who understand this history. They're the ones who are in solidarity for racial justice. Um, there was a campus, um, uh, one of the campus ministries where they have a huge Asian American, uh, uh, you know, I think it was one of the biggest student groups on campus is the Asian American campus ministry, right? And uh, one of the leaders there said, you know, there's so much race problems in our campus. Can't Asian Americans make a contribution here because we're the biggest campus, like we're the biggest student group on campus. I mean, not even like campus ministry, biggest student group on campus. And I said, well, you can make a difference if you actually knew who you were, right? If you have no history, you have no understanding of yourself, how would you actually make sense of what's happening? How would you enter into discussions about, um, justice or black lives matters or what's happening in other places if you don't understand your situation now uh, for people who talk about being allies or people who are uh, allies for uh, solidarity for marginalized people they always talk about allies should know who they are you cannot be ignorant you have to know your situation you, you know if you're going to be an ally if i'm going to be an ally for women i have to really know what it means to be a man like I can't be ob oblivious to that because I can do a lot of damage and I can actually hurt a lot of people. For Asian Americans to be part of the broader racial discussion, we really have to know where we fit in and how we understand ourselves. If we don't know that, it's really hard to enter in uh, or we enter in without knowing any history, right? So uh, there's a long history of Asian Americans uh, interacting in, in solidarity with, with, with uh, African American community and uh, learning from black community. But all that will be hidden if you, if you don't know history, right? If you don't know history. Uh, so getting back to it once again, uh, God of covenant, creation, and kingdom. Uh, uh, I think it's thinking about what does it mean, the fact that God enters and interacts with us in history in a particular time and situation? What does it mean, the fact that God... Uh, um, um, that our particular bodies matter? Right, and it's in, and our salvation includes our bodies, right? My Asian American body, my Korean American body, heritage, all that stuff, right? It's part of uh, what happens in, in our, our salvation and reconciliation, and the resurrection, and the fact that uh, uh, in 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 the kingdom, uh, God comes and He deals with the powers and principalities of this world. Racism is like that, right? You know, like there's greed, there's capitalism, different ways in which uh, powers and principalities of this world are, are, are oppressing, right? Uh, oppressing um, the world. And in this way, uh, when Christ comes and proclaims the kingdom, Christ proclaims the fact that Christ is he's Lord over all these powers and principalities. Um, so with that in mind, I want to kind of talk about what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us uh, in terms of in terms of ministry, right? In terms of uh, you know, in terms of worship, right? How does it impact how we think about worship? Because if we worship this God, who's a God of covenants, who's a God of God of creation, who's a God of God of kingdom, right? 
how how does it, it should come naturally, right? It's not just one week. It's something that we we include when we pray, when we read scripture, we see it in scripture, right? We uh, we pray about these things. We can sing about these things, right? In our discipleship, we say, wait a minute, this actually matters for how we think about how we follow Christ because this is actually uh, uh, this is a God that we follow, right? And uh, when we talk about the kind of kingdom that we're entering into and the kingdom uh, rule that God, you know, Christ is inviting on to us to, right? That's how we live out our discipleship. And in terms of our mission, we see these things as a church, not only as individuals, we say, um, how does it impact how we think about, how we, how we look at, our, uh, see our neighbors. I want to kind of talk about three different ways that these things, worship, discipleship, and mission kind of gets impacted. The first thing is embodied. Uh, you know, our worship, discipleship, and mission should be really embodied and in context, which basically means this. We, uh, uh, it can't be just over-spiritualized. I think a lot of times uh, people think about, well, why does it really matter because we're going to go to heaven, right? It's because, and we, we th- tend to think, well, what happens in our bodies don't really matter. Well, it turns out that um, salvation really includes all of our bodies, all of who we are. So how, how do we... Um, how do we acknowledge the fact that people can actually be uh, be angry and be afraid? And how do we attend to those things, right? How do we kind of pray for those things? How do we help process those things? How do we give our anger to God? Uh, I think one of the things, things that I always say uh, to my students is that Christ, the gospel makes us more human, right? Gospel makes us more human. It shouldn't make us less human. It shouldn't make us like not acknowledge our emotions, not acknowledge our fears, not acknowledge our angers, not acknowledge all the things that are happening with inside of us, right? If you read the Psalms, it actually acknowledges these things. I mean, when you read the Psalms, it talks about the enemy, right? And I think people find it weird or they ignore it altogether. Uh, how many times does a Psalm talk about, uh, you know, all, and all the laments, obviously, right? All the ways that they're hurt, all the ways that they're anxious, all the ways that they're angry. Right, the fact that there are enemies in life, and it doesn't mean the fact that we hate these hate you know particular people, but there is there's actually this this overall spiritual power that actually expressed in particular racism, and it's not just individual people, right? Because powers are not individual people, Th- that serves as an enemy, and we can acknowledge that. You can acknowledge that and be like, this is an enemy that that we, that we resist, that that, uh, that is oppressing us, that oppressing the world. Um, I think the second thing is to think about justice, and it's actually important once again to not to not think about it as a interpersonal kind of reconciliation. And I I don't know if you know in, the, in a lot of circles, people have kind of really gotten away from this idea of racial reconciliation because racial reconciliation ended up kind of appeasing people to make peace with the system. It was like let's all kind of get along. If we can get along with individuals, make friends, you know, and if we can all respect each other then it's fine. Well, it turns out if the problem is not individual people, if the problem is powers and principalities, we need God's kingdom to come and actually deal with the powers and principalities. We need to deal with the, 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 the culture of racism, right? And not just, uh, not just individuals who are racist. Um, you know, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the idea of implicit bias. The fact that because uh, the idea of implicit bias is that, let me, you know, I'll kind of remind this once again, is that something's happening within our society, in our media, in our brain that bypasses our consciousness, right? Our volition. So even though I don't want to be racist, even though I don't want to be sexist, all these images and all those programming gets part of my brain. It programs how I think and it's taken over, right? I think to some degree, it's one of the reasons why we talk about the renewing of our mind. How do we renew our mind? and kind of transform how we think about and how we view the world. Because the world's already taken over. It's already kind of totally infiltrated how, how we think. I mean, even little kids, right? That we have certain reactions when we see a black person. We have certain reactions when we see a white person. We have certain reactions when we look at the mirror. Uh, for a lot of Asian Americans. So uh, uh, to kind of long for that great, deeper justice, right below the surface and not just well if we just love each other it's fine right um i think that the last point is this idea of difference 
Um, so many churches, and this is something that, you know, Dennis has been sharing about as well, right? <clears throat> um, in different podcasts. I think in so many contexts, in so many churches, we think the idea is colorblindness. The idea is not to see difference. Now, what the Bible talks about is the fact that, you know, these di human differences that we have, it shouldn't serve as dividing, they shouldn't be dividing walls dif between human differences. But what, what we've done is to say, there are no differences. It's though all of us are kind of big soup, which is not true. People have different experiences and different narratives and different callings. So how do we acknowledge the differences and not use that to discriminate, not use that to exclude? That's part of, the, part of what churches have to do when we talk about worship, discipleship, and mission. Um, uh, one of the biggest things that happens, I think, is we kind of misunderstand uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, when we look at his uh, I've Dream speech, it sounds as though, and to some degree he is, talking about kind of a generic colorblindness. It doesn't really matter what your skin is. It's the content of your character. But most people are misreading MLK. MLK, after the Civil Rights Act, it's totally different. Before the Civil Rights Act, right, of 1964, this is what was happening. MLK was, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to figure out how do, how do all of us be treated equally? Now, after the Civil Rights Act, people realize, okay, we have to really see the problem here because we have to fix the problem, right? In order for us to be treated equally, we have to fix the problem, we have to see the problem. So people start talking a lot more about race. And then all these people who are still racist said, oh, talking about race is racist. We shouldn't talk about race. The problem is if you don't talk about race, if you just become generally colorblind, all the problems, all the, all the ways in which uh, the racism in terms of its cultural influence in terms of how it's infiltrated historically all the, all the infrastructure and systems, they just remain. Like nothing happens to them, right? And we just, we just turn a blind eye because those things aren't going to just go away because we don't talk about it. I think how I think about it is that uh, um, how Jesus, you know, always names a demon. There's something about naming the problem that gives you control and power or something. What's happening in a lot of, for a lot of churches and Christians is that they don't want to name the problem. Right, so therefore, just uh, just the demon itself kind of just keeps on functioning on the background without us being able to know what's happening. So this is one of the reasons why church needs to talk about racism and understand that well, understand what this thing is. Right, uh, uh, it's turned out the fact that one of the ways we can be racist now is not to talk about all the structural realities. Right. It doesn't mean that we talk about race and try to treat people differently, but to say, wait a minute, this is actually what's happening within our society. And these things, we have to flesh it out. We have to name them and we have to, we have to take them apart. Otherwise, they'll, 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 they'll literally be all soaking in, filling in our society and our systems. Um, so that's probably one of the most important things I think for us to kind of think about, right? How do we talk about them? And all the theological things that, things that I talked about, that kind of I mentioned, without those things, it's really hard to figure out how to talk about uh, some of these, uh, you know, issues of race and about justice. Because um, I think we, in American history, in American, American evangelicalism, it's focused so much on the afterlife. It's focused so much on our individual souls, in a sense that we don't really read the Bible this way. We don't, we ignore parts of the Bible where God's actually coming in, thinking about history, thinking of interacting with people in particular contexts and, and we're, you know, and interacting with the physical needs as, as well as a spiritual. Um, I, I thought about this. I think, um, so I want to end with two things. I think the first thing is, uh, you know, I thought about, uh, because I'm talking to vineyard people and, you know, and not all of you might be vineyard people, but vineyard, you know, I think with this, this idea of kind of being the radical middle and that um, uh, I think, you know, Wimber was trying to figure out how do you kind of be uh, charismatic without, without kind of being Pentecostal, be, be, be still having roots in the evangelical. I think one way of thinking about kind of the radical me middle from my perspective is to be supernatural without ignoring the embodied and contextual realities. How do you think, and I think to some degree, you know, Vineyard's already doing that, right? 
how do you have the supernatural and kind of pray for powers and principalities, right? And resist those things in our supernatural ministry. At the same time, pay attention to the fact that these things have, these things actually have concrete sociological roots. Like, you know, government has to get involved, right? And, and, and the systems within the government has to change. Like our institutions have to change. We can't kind of pray. We can't just, you know, we're praying for these concrete changes to happen, right? So it's not just like if all of us become Christian, it'll disappear. Because it, it's the, the, the powers and principles that are there is beyond individual people. So um, that's, that, that's uh, the second to last thing. And the last thing is, I think a lot of people, when they learn about this, even when they learn about Asian American history, even when you watch the documentary Asian Americans, um, people get angry. Um, and, and some Christians are like, well, I, you know, I think it's really disturbing that people get angry. And I'm like, well, I mean, if you see injustice, you should get angry. Like, you should be like, oh. <laughs> I, it, the question is, what do, you, what do you do with your anger? And the fact that in the end, in our anger, there's a limit to our anger because in the, uh, ultimately God is the judge. God's the one that brings justice. It's not like we can, uh, uh, of our human efforts, just bring it about. So, um, I tell my students in general, like, you have to keep on going through the anger so that you can kind of um, be faithful and, and be a, a leader in terms of how to make, uh, cha- bring about change. Um, but you can't bypass the anger because there's just so much injustice and historically as well, that the, the roots of injustice go so deep. So um, there's a lot that I covered here. And uh, Hopefully, uh, you know, I'm trying to kind of bring all this stuff together so you can kind of, uh, when you talk about it in ministry or when you, when, you, when you kind of interact with people, you kind of have all the theological roots as well. So uh, at this time, you can kind of uh, go into more of the um, Q&A. Let me stop sharing so we can kind of, uh, wait a minute, what happened to you? There you go. All right. So. Just a reminder to post any questions in the chat and we'll get to them. There is one question from Carolyn and Elizabeth so far. They have the same question. So it says, Carolyn wrote, I'm surprised to hear that racial reconciliation has become problematic when it was recently taught as the better alternative to colorblindness. Can you expand on that? So Daniel, do you want to chime in on that? And then maybe I can as well. Yeah, this is a really, really important point. Um, Racial reconciliation sits upon... Uh, kind of a, uh, um, a idea of multiculturalism, right? Racial reconciliation basically said this, and multiculturalism says this as well, right? It basically says everybody's kind of on an equal playing ground, and they all have differences, so we should kind of get along, right? So you know, people said, why don't black and white people get along? Why don't pe- different people get along, right? Uh, well, it's kind of hard to get along when one person is shooting the other person, and this is actually a broader historical structure problem. Right. So people uh, in the last, uh, I think, uh, you know, how many years people have said, wait, wait a minute, it's not racial reconciliation. It's not talking about people getting along with each other because the problem is not just people. The problem is what's happening in our society. The problem is it's like it lasts for hundreds of years and it's literally infiltrated all of our educational system. It's infiltrated all of our political system. It's infiltrated all of our, our media. So people getting along is, is just tip of the iceberg. That's basically why people said, look, it's basically making people kind of blind to the bigger problem. And that's one of the reasons why people don't use, you know, people who do this kind of work don't talk about racial reconciliation. They talk about race of justice and said, how do we bring about kind of a kingdom justice, which is actually very different than just people getting along and making friends with other people. Even if I may have had black friends and, and white friends, it's not going to solve the problem because the problem is so much deeper within our society and deep in the world. And that's basically why we have to call it out. We have to name that thing. Daniel, would you agree with this, that um, when we're talking about color blindness, um, it's harder for people of color to navigate with the perspective of color blindness but it has tended to be that it's the white community that's pressing for color blindness because they're not navigating the everyday challenges of the color and how the color of their skin and their ethnicity, they have to integrate that into their everyday life. And so if, if people of color that are really pressing for that piece, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a term, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of, you know, like white supremacy, right? 
uh, you know, like KKKs, the white supremacists, you know, they think white people are better than other people, right? And I think I would say, uh, like, a lot of average Americans, and definitely Christians, they're, they're like, this is terrible. I mean, I don't think I'm better. But, but there's this whole other idea that people realize is happening. It's called white normativity. It's like, well, you know, like, for example, when you, in your mind, think about what's an average Christian, I mean, average, like, American, you might think of, like, a white person. That's white normativity. Like, it, it's like a default mode, right? So when we talk about colorblindness, it actually ends up being, well, why don't we just be normal? And that normal ends up being white normal. Uh, and this, this idea goes so deeply entrenched in our systems that all, all, everything is set for this way. And, and see, people who study white normativity talk about even how medical system, you know that the dosage of medication, right? The, the, the dosage of medication is set for a, a white male of certain height. That's why, that's why for some people it doesn't work or it's too much. And, and when I learned about this, I was like, oh yeah, because people are different. How do, we, how do we all have two pills of this thing? That's really odd because it's, it's set for a particular norm. And for some people, I mean, some of the things, it might not matter as much, but other things, it matters a lot. It actually does a lot of damage. For example, if you call yourself multi-ethnic and diverse, but everything's set in a way that's actually kind of white normative, well, this is just what we do. Then, like, you know, you see, I see you just like I see myself or whatever. If a white person says that, they're basically erasing all of my particular experiences and saying, those are like some side things. It's not like a basic human thing that I can connect with. That's basically why uh, colorblindness makes everything white normative and emphasizes that even more, which basically aggravates the injustice. So you're, you're absolutely right, Dennis. Awesome. Hey, remember to post any questions that you have in the chat, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask a question while we're waiting for others to come in. So Daniel, many of us are processing the whole situation with Ahmad Arbery. And I wonder if you have any comments when it comes to anti-Asian racism and how that connects in with racism in general, or maybe specifically anti-Black racism. Um, where do you see the connect of, of, the, of those? This is a great question. Uh, you know, the two things, people who've actually understood, like, uh, okay, Japanese American community. Um, this is kind of an example. Japanese American community who, you know, they, they lived through, like, you know, being incarcerated. They were, like, jailed, put in concentration camps, right, uh, during World War II. Uh, people, Japanese Americans who basically embraced that and said, like, this is a great injustice, we're going to fight this thing, they actually ended up being one of the, one of the greatest supporters for Muslim, Muslim Americans during, uh, September, after September 11th, right? They realized, wait a minute, this can't happen to somebody else. So they took up the idea of injustice um, and kind of took it on, right? There are a lot of Japanese Americans who said, you know what? That was so painful. We're going to erase that. We're going to be as white as possible. So nobody bothers us. For those people, they didn't care about justice. Like, they're like, okay, Muslims, you should try to be American as well, right? Maybe you'll be Christian or whatever. I think what I'm saying is people who understand this particular history and people understand themselves can kind of take up and understand and think about uh, justice for, you know, on the undocumented or Muslims or Black Lives Matter, right? A lot of people who understand Asian American studies, they're the people who are absolutely for Black Lives Matter, right? Like, you know, and because they realize it's, it's part of the whole same system. For anti-Blackness, I mean, so a lot of people say, look, what about all the anti-Black sentiment within Asians? It's kind of like how some, you'll, you'll find some black people who have anti-black sentiment. They call it internalized racism. You kind of absorb these things. And for a lot of Asian Americans who kind of try to be as white as possible, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to be like, well, look, black people are the problem because society tells us black people are the problem and I'm trying to be as white as possible. So I think these are the things, once you kind of understand how, how the powers and principles have taken over our minds, all of us all together, then you can say, all the justice ideas kind of all function all together. Like white, uh, the idea of keeping a whiteness and kind of historical history of uh, white racism interacts with everybody differently, but it's, this problem is same, this idea of white normativity. And it, it, it can kind of falls upon black lives the most, in, in the most kind of uh, heinous way, but it actually interacts with uh, anti-Asianness kind of slightly differently and it's hard to kind of recognize what that is.
right? For the people who understand the system, that's basically why for the people who study this stuff, there's a lot of solidarity among everybody else. Like there are a lot of black people who are like, okay, I totally support, you know, like this fight for anti-justice, but people who don't understand that there might be some black people like, well, look, I hate Asians too, right? Because they've internalized that and they don't know what the system, how, how all these dimensions are kind of functioning. So I think seeing the bigger picture, you realize it's all different expressions of the same racist kind of ideology that's happening. Mm. Elizabeth asks a really great question here. She says, as we've tried to explore discussions related to racial discrimination and systemic racism within our ethnically, culturally, socioeconomically diverse congregation, we find that we are preaching to the choir. How do we open up these conversations in a way that is inviting and provides space for others to have exposure to these issues that are so relevant to the body as a whole? Wait a minute. So you're saying your congregation is like this, but you want other people within the community to talk about it or... Yeah, I'm trying to clarify what that that's, what, that's what I think she's asking. And like, let me let me kind of uh, interpret a little bit. I think sometimes when you try to talk about this racism piece, uh, people get defensive, right? They immediately, you know, they immediately shut off or they feel like, you know, why are you bringing this up? Or they will just feel like, you know, we've been the colorblind way is good. How do you engage people that are not really in tune, aware and wanting to talk about this piece of racism? I think that's her question. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... Because, because it's literally like, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a paradigm thing, right? Because it's, it, what we're talking about is invisible. I mean, we talk about powers, and this is why I think that the idea of powers and principalities, powers and principalities is so helpful. It, you want to point to something specific. Like, for example, when a police shooting happens, they're like, well, is the police officer white? Oh, do they have black friends? Is he racist, right? Or, and that's actually a totally what, wrong way of thinking about it because that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, we're talking about a, a deeper structural problem because if the police officer had black friends, if the police officer was black, the, 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 the society structures don't really go away. So how do you kind of reveal that? And I think that's one of the reasons why it's hard to kind of argue these points. If they don't really see a different way of thinking about the world, it's, it's like for them, it's like literally like yeah, incomprehensible to see, see what you're talking about. I would say, um, you know, whenever I talk about this thing, I say like, it's not personal. Like, I'm not talking about you. Like, oh, you're this person. Like, you're male, so therefore you must be sexist. No, I always say as a male, I'm like, I'm I'm probably already guilty because it's in society and I'm in, I've internalized so much of it, right? But it's not blaming myself for this thing because that's not really helpful, right? It's it, it's it's looking at the whole structure and how we partake in that. I think that's basically, uh, that's actually really helpful to think about. I mean, in terms of interacting with, with, uh, with our bro broader community, it's, it's to really make sure you build trust and you can take, you can take kind of bite sizes and also not to, not to use more, uh, you know, uh, I think sometimes people who get this, talk about this thing, uh, because it's, it's so infuriating sometimes. Um, uh, we can kind of kind of uh, run over people with our emotions, so it's very important for us to kind of be rooted and make sure that we kind of can, we can kind of walk people through step by step of where this is, instead of saying, "Look, this is basically all racist. This is actually kind of white supremacy." Like I don't really use the word white supremacy. I, I, I kind of walk people through it to say, "This is what I mean by this thing," because, like I said, uh, if you understand white normativity and how subtle that is, that's actually the the way that it functions, right? It's not functioning at the level of like people thinking they're better. It's just it's a very implicit. Um, I'm just normal, right? I'm just being myself. Um, so having better language. Uh, kind of presenting ourselves emotionally, right? So that we're not leaking. I've talked about leaking to so many people where a lot of activists just emotionally leak too much and that's very hard to listen to. And that's something you have to do your own work to make sure that that doesn't happen. And then just kind of, you know, build, uh, try to figure out how it connects to their people's individual lives. You can't actually, you can't present a, an idea of the world that ignores their experience. You have to figure out, look, this is your experience and I understand the fact that you actually suffer this way. I'm not saying that's not, that's, that doesn't happen. I'm saying this is actually how your experience fits into a bigger picture. So you wanna always acknowledge people's experience and try to figure out how that fits in. Because if, if, if there is a, you, you wanna validate people's experiences in the limited scope and then help make sense of that in, in, a, in a broader structure. Hopefully that makes sense. Awesome. Stephanie, I think uh, Daniel just answered your question at the same time. 
Uh, go ahead and chime in if, if you need more on that, but I think he just answered that one as well. Samuel's asking, is this a moment to reconcile with parts of the Asian American community slash church that are not on board for racial justice, i.e. against affirmative action, Chinese Trump supporters, et cetera, or better to move on without them? Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I, you know, if, if we can, I think, the issue is, it's, it's a longer process, right? I mean, like, for example, in my class, I have them for 10 weeks. I kind of walk them through step by step by step, right? So you can kind of see. And this, I think the reason why I think history is really helpful is to be like, oh, this is actually what happened to me before. Just the facts of what really happened. You're like, oh, that's interesting. So it kind of starts. So I think you can use this moment to kind of focus on kind of Asian American awareness and history in general. Um, but we should do our own thing. We can't wait for other people, right? I think we, you know, hopefully there'll be, uh, you know, we could be faithful and expressing, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, justice for uh, Ahmaud Arbery and, you know, and, uh, and, and other kind of Black Lives Matter issues. Um, and and to, be, to be vocal as much as possible and to understand the fact that there are other Asian, non-Asian, non-Christian, but Asian American organizations that's actually been doing this work for a long time. Like American movement and Asian American resistance, resistance have been going on for 50 years. So learning about that as well. I think this is the moment to learn about history and raise the awareness for everybody. This is the moment to speak up for people who understand and really keep on, keep on beating solidarity. Uh, this is a moment to kind of really speak to and help people understand more of a broader issues about structural racism, right? Because people think, some of the people are ignoring it because they think, once again, this is just an isolated incident. And I'm like, well, it is and it's not, right? There's a, there's a longer, deeper root to what's happening, and we want to understand that. So, um, yeah, how do you kind of understand that? How do you navigate these things well? And once again, how do we kind of, how do we present ourselves well? Because it's very difficult to do when, you know, it, it can be very infuriating just in terms of navigating these things when people just, people literally refuse to see what's happening. And I think that's a spiritual thing as well. I mean, people literally refusing to see reality and it's happening at multiple levels. I think that, that's, I think that's a spiritual fight. We, we got to really pray for as well. That prayer and, uh, and praying for God's kingdom and, and the activist work, I think it really integrates well together. And we need to really pray for that. It's, it's that kind of radical middle that I think that we really need. Carolyn, I think asked a great question. And just for context, Carolyn is white. And she asked this question, how do I be a part of the racial justice movement without being a quote unquote white savior? Yeah, one of the most important things is to learn who you are really well, right? And, and, and I would say, I mean, like, for example, like there actually, there are a lot of Asian Americans who are like, oh, you know, like they think they're the first one. They don't know anything about Asian American history. Like, hey, there's something wrong with Asian American people. We're all oblivious. We're all anti-black. Well, I mean, anti-blackness is in the Asian American culture. But, I mean, Asian American communities, but they don't understand any of Asian American history, community, activism, and they think they're the first ones. That's very, very dangerous. I think for a lot of, a lot, if you understand even the history, right, uh, and multiple histories of how um, how whiteness played. I mean, there's a great book called History of White People, right, by Princeton historian. It's not as contemporary, but it's a great book. I mean, there's so many books out there right now, you know, Waking Up, I think, Wide Awake. There's so many books about that. So I think navigating that really well, I think, is, is, the, is, the, is, is the first part. I mean, I would, if I were you, I would have like a, like a small library of what it means to be white. Because, and not about being black. I think a lot of people think, well, I'm going to learn about black people. I'm like, that's fine, but you have to learn about yourself and how you play the role. And it's just in terms of structurally. That's actually going to really kind of help you to understand um, how to navigate this. And there are a lot of Christian books out there. There's a lot of, of course, non-Christian books out there. They're all really helpful to think about and to know how you can navigate this thing. Like, um, White Fragility is a great book. I mean, if you, if you don't want to read the book, <laughs> the whole, her whole video is, uh, is, is on YouTube. So you can watch that. And she just breaks it down so brainily. So it's really, really helpful to kind of understand those dynamics. And then, and then you can avoid some of the pitfalls. Awesome. We can probably take one or two more questions if you want to post it. But while we wait, Daniel, I have one for you. Um, the modern minority kind of uh, um, stereotype I think the PBS documentary kind of touched on this, but 
do you see that kind of stigma and stereotype kind of kind of helping with the, or kind of fostering the tension with the other ethnic groups uh, as people see Asians as a minor, model minority that kind of puts a wedge between the Asians and other groups? Right. That's literally how it was used, right? But when we say model minority, not like the other minority, right? That's so the whole idea of modern minority is that, look, these people can work hard and make it through. So why are these other people complaining? I mean, that's literally how it started, right? So it's fundamentally a wedge. It's fundamental. It's, it's at its basic, basic roots, right? You can put your, pull yourself by the bootstraps, whereas black people can't. But it, it, so it's an it's a excuse. Modern minority is an excuse not to do anything about racial, racial justice. That's basically what it is. That's, so when Asian Americans kind of are oblivious and say, well, look, we're fine. Like, you're not understanding what's happening. And actually, if you study, like, uh, there's a book called The Myth of Mo uh, Modern Minority by, you talk about, like, a, like uh, one of my biggest uh, examples of kind of Asian Americans experiencing racism is that it's very subtle and it's very toxic, but it's actually kind of, it's in the water. We absorb it. And Asian Americans can't even label it. But you know, like, there'll be like random suicides. Like some of the suicide routes of Asian Americans is really, really high. It's because it's still racism, but we don't know what's going on because it's not like in your face and it's still killing people, right? So uh, this is where understanding those dynamics are really, really helpful. And that wedge idea is so, so fundamental. I think for people who uh, understand the Asian American experience, stay very close to the black experience as well and learn a lot from them and that sort of there is super super important um otherwise you really you know it's like it, it, whether it be colonization or racism it's always been divide and conquer how you divide and conquer like you know and how do you separate and how do you kind of let the minority people fight amongst each other while, while their power systems kind of remain in place and that's just another way that that, that kind of like the enemy kind of ends up leaving its powers and principalities to rule <laughs> without actually changing anything. Good, good. Mariana has a question here. She said, uh, can you expand upon how to address issues of racism slash sexism outside of the church, such as in corporate America, especially when there are other power dynamics at play in such a hierarchical structure? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, I think the first thing to kind of, it, I mean, there's so many resources on this, right? There's actually so many books on this thing. And, and uh, it's, uh, for example, like if you, if you read that book on implicit bias uh, called Hidden, Hidden Blind Spots, because uh, that's actually where, it's, where the level was at, right? We're not talking about people who are like, I mean, there are people who are just straightforward sexist, who are racist, but a lot of people and what's happening within the whole, the whole culture of, of an organization it's actually a lot of this implicit bias stuff, right? So it's like how we see what a leader is. Well, obviously a leader has to be white, tall man, right? And that idea is so ingrained in all of our brains that even if we ask different people, you know, how, who we hire, who we promote, that's all part of it. So I think understanding the dynamics is really, really helpful. And, and in that book, Bl uh, uh, Blind Spots, it talks about how you, you have to set up the systems in such a way so, uh, the, uh, so that people aren't just making decisions. Like, you know, for example, I think they have a, they have an example of like how we, how they interview blind interviews, right? So that you don't know who the person is. So you don't slightly prefer the man. You don't slightly prefer the white person. I mean, this is going across. So I think I, those are the kind of things that we do. I mean, I'm part of the diversity council. I'm on the chair. Uh, I'm the, I'm the co-chair of the diversity council of Fuller. And the amount of things that we have to do. Um, to make sure that we protect kind of uh, justice and kind of diversity is very, very difficult to do. Uh, I would say start looking at the resources. There's a lot of resources on kind of diversity and inclusion initiatives. And it's just a long fight. It's just a long fight. It's slowly kind of inching up. Uh, I think a simple way of saying it is how do you kind of raise the lowest common denominator of how people think about diversity awareness. Like not, not, now a lot of our faculty at Fuller know what white normativity is, implicit bias is. So they, they know these things, right? And hopefully, and I think the question is how much did they internalize it and kind of believe it, but they actually know what the terms are. So it's kind of interesting in terms and kind of slowly inching toward uh, a place where, where the decisions are made with these things in mind. Every decision is made with uh, issues about inclusion and diversity in mind. And that takes a lot of uh, 
uh, institutional will, willpower, and commitment. Again, we're going to close out with this one last question because I think it ties in a lot with the COVID-19 situation. I've heard you teach uh, several times and you really pressed the piece about um, emphasizing race and ethnicity. Sometimes we overemphasize the ethnicity part. And in this COVID-19 situation, I think that's become come more to the forefront, right? People, um, not just Chinese people are being blamed for the virus, but just people that yeah. have, an Asian, have Asian features are being blamed right. and are being targeted. So can you just speak into that piece about the importance of focusing on, on race and not just ethnicity? Yeah, I mean, look, cultural background and ethnicity is easy. Like, oh, you have different culture. Like that difference is pretty easy for people to handle because there's no structural dimension to it, right? There's actually no like, there's no like uh, systemic dimension, right? Because it just seems like we're just different and we're, we're appreciating each other. I think this is one of the reasons why I tell people in the ministries too, we should be, recognize that there, there, there are multiple things here, right? You, 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 and, and some, this is why, the reason why this is so confusing is because a lot of people use ethnicity and race interchangeably. And even like some of the academics use them interchangeably. So uh, what I tell people is like, think of it this way. Think about ethnicity as like a cultural background and race as more about phenotypical, like what your features are, right? So you might have a Jamaican, Nigerian, and a, and a black American. They're all black, but ethnically, culturally, they're actually very, very different. If you think a Nigerian immigrant, you know, recent immigrant, they think totally different than like a black American, right? To have those different categories in your mind and how we deal with them will really help a lot, right? So when we deal with anti, you know, Asian, uh, Asian racism, I mean, you're talking about a racialized experience. You're talking about a phenotypical experience of what you look like. You might have like a Hmong American, Filipino American, you know, experiencing all these different things. I think in ministry as well, um, I tell people like, how do you actually have a category for race and cultural difference and then racial difference? And, and racial difference has to do with really systems and history, right? So, and when you talk about race in ministries, make sure they're talking about race and they're not, they're not thinking that Asian Americans are white. Because times like this, you realize, oh, wait a minute, we're not really white. There's a, there's a term called honorary white, where we become pseudo white enough, but there are situations where it shows the fact that, oh my gosh, you're not, right? In certain limited cases, it seems like, you know, Asian American kind of play as white, but in a lot of cases it doesn't. So that's why it's, it's important to understand the history of those things and understand how to deal with two different categories, right? History of racialization, like a, a great uh, book is called like there's a great book called White by Law. It's talking about how whiteness was defined by talking about Asian immigrants and do they are they white or black? And they crystallized the definition of whiteness. This is kind of legal history, right? Uh, by by studying those cases, and so like are, are Indian Americans white or are, are like Asian you know Chinese Americans white? So. I think this idea of understanding race as different than ethnic or cultural heritage is really, really important for us to think about in ministry as well. When we talk about multi-ethnic ministry, is multi-ethnic ministry, multi-ethnic multi ministry or the multi-racial multi ministry? Well, hopefully both, but you want to think about those things and have categories to understand those things. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everyone. Um, there are some questions about how we can stay connected to the Vineyard Justice Network and future webinars and discussions and about a, a list of books. We're going to email that out. So I'll email that out afterwards. And there's some resources that Daniel mentioned along the way. So we'll, I have everyone's email address, so we'll email out those resources. Um, Daniel, do you think you could just close us in prayer? Pray for all of us. We're all navigating this. Um, and so we'd love it if you could pray it in closing. Yeah. Ah, gracious God. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We long for God, your kingdom, God. And we realize that uh, even as you call us to uh, prophetic acts, acts of faithfulness, uh, we know that you are uh, the ultimate uh, arbiter. You are the one where we long look to for justice, for peace, for true shalom. God, we pray uh, that you'll give us wisdom. You'll give, us, you'll give us strength. Uh, and uh, at times when we're overwhelmed emotionally, mentally, uh, just physically, uh, tend to us, God. Yes. Minister to us. Give us wisdom. Give us strength. And restore us continually. Yes. We pray for our nation. We pray for our communities. And uh, 
we, we pray and long after you, God. Uh, be with us all. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone. Let's do this again sometime.